Glorious Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this morning. We thank you and praise you for everyone here this morning, Father. We praise you, Lord God, for the message that was about is about to be um, given. So we thank you, Lord God, that uh, you are kind and, and gentle, and you also um, you also make sure that we're here so we can hear the word, Lord, so that we can our lives will change dramatically each and every Sunday. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, Father in heaven, it is a gift, Lord, your church to your people, Lord, a place of worship and praise of your holiness and of your glory. And Lord, as we heard in the chorus, Lord, that our sin is great, but your love is greater. Hallelujah for that, Lord. But I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared, Lord, that um, we came before you, Lord, in repentance and in faith, Lord, to confess that sin. Lord, we are so needy of that humility, Lord, to see it aright and to see it your way. Lord, teach us to be repenters, Lord, to ask for forgiveness for our sin each and every day, Lord, that um, when we do confess, Lord, you forgive from heaven, Lord, and cleanse our souls, Lord, that we don't bear the guilt and shame of our sin. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm for that wrath-removing, sin-removing yes. peace that you give our consciences yes. and our hearts. Mm -hmm. And Lord, continue to do mighty works in us, Lord, drawing us nearer by the power and truth of the gospel. Lord, with great and glorious truths we know to be true about you, Lord, I pray that our souls would connect with them this morning when we hear them from your word exposited to our souls. So Lord, speak through your servant, Lord God, that we would hear the voice of the Lord Almighty mm. calling us, Lord, drawing us near to live a life set apart from this world and for the glory of God. Mm. Lord, we praise you for your mercy on our souls. Oh, yes. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Jesus, we just thank you um, for the chance to be together. Thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for the life-changing, transforming gospel of yes, uh, Jesus Christ in which we uh, take our stand. Yes, we do. Uh, which we uh, hold fast to you. So speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, as we continue in a spirit of worship and praise of you, Lord, that the truth and the beauty and the splendor of the fact that uh, we are children of God, mm -hmm. that it would just uh, resonate down and just uh, explode before our very hearts and minds this morning in a transforming way. Mm -hmm. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> So good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Good morning, God. What a blessing it is for brethren to dwell, to dwell together in this way in praise and worship of the only true God. This morning, I have the privilege of reading you some verses from the book of 1 John. <laughs> Out of chapter 3, I'll be reading you verses 1 through 10, which you can find on page 1208 in our pew Bible. And if you're able, please stand. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, Sin is lawlessness. But you know that He appeared so that He might take away our sins. And in Him is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. 
No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who was born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning, because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are. And who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. Nor is anyone who does not love his brother. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. Amen. 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 Awesome words here from John's epistle here, 1 John chapter 3. Um, we have your fill in the blanks. If you like to fill in blanks, you got those. And um, we're continuing this morning uh, a new series of messages, uh, understanding, appreciating, and practicing the basics of the faith for a deepening, ever-deepening relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And last week, we saw from Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in us. We've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in us. In the life we live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. This morning, the title is Understanding and Appreciating the Greatness of God. And um, the central idea is God is great. And I was sharing with some people during the week as it relates to the central idea of the text in verse 1. It was like, how else? It seems like... Like I just said, God is great. And we're all just, I mean, we're just getting into it now. We're just getting ready. We're going to hear the word. God is great. Amen. And it's like, yeah, all right, yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. So it's he's great. Yeah, he's great. It's like, if there was a bigger way to say it, maybe we would explode off of our seats or we would be slain in the spirit. No. Um, something would happen to us, right? If we think about the greatness of God, I think I just messed this thing up. I was going to bring in my illustration of, um, you know, Frosted Flakes, Tony and Tiger. They're great. That was the advertising back in my day. I was going to ask you guys if you do it, but you probably would know. But anyways, but how to say this, okay? So because God is great, let's appreciate these two truths here that are going to come flashing up here in a minute. Because God is great, let's appreciate the greatness of God's love for his children is the first one, okay? The greatness of God's love for his children is the first one. And the second one is in your bulletin, the greatness of God's propitiation for his children. Mm. And I chose that word on purpose, but when I get there, I'll explain that. So, Holy Spirit, just illuminate the, the glorious truth here about the greatness of God before our very eyes and hearts here this morning. That we would be, our socks would be knocked off. That we would just be so affected by the glory of the greatness of God in calling us, in saving us, in enabling us to be children of God, and in removing uh, your wrath against us, Lord, that we can have a relationship with you and live for you, and we can have an advocate, one that we can go to, when we do sin, and we can be washed, cleansed, cleansed by the blood of Christ continuously, and live in vital union with Him. Help us, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, Lord. to see the greatness of that this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the greatness of God's love for His children. Verse 1. First part of verse 1. See how great a love. Oh, Dan, I liked how you did that. Were they in red last week? Yeah. I just didn't notice. Okay, I like how you did that. They stand out good. See how great a love the Father has bestowed 
John, were you reading from the NIV? Mm. It said lavished yeah. on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Just like when I say, and such we are, amen. we all want to say, amen, yes, amen. praise the Lord. Amen. See how great a love. So brothers and sisters, there's something extraordinary out of this world here in these verses that God wants us to see. And in the whole epistle of 1 John, we actually had a sermon series. We went through it a couple of years ago. The whole purpose of the sermon series is to see uh, the truth of who God is and who we are in the light of His glorious presence and how being a child of God ought to affect us, affect our lives. It's great. It's five chapters. You could read one today. You could read, read it right through the week. It'll be done by what? Friday? Saturday? Yeah. Um, the adjective which is translated how great or what manner of love is found only seven times in the New Testament. And it implies the reaction of complete astonishment. That's why when I said, see how great a love that God has for us, I'd also evoke that response of just awesome, complete astonishment, uh, joy, uh, delight, praise for those that are his people. Right? So much so that the rocks would scream out and cry out. Right? Right. This morning, right? right? And it literally means how great the manner of God's love for us is. In the original, it's like, it's like, of what country? It's like, this is just like foreign. This is just like indescribable, the greatness of God's love. It's utterly out of this world, foreign to anything else that we could know or experience, bestowed on us, given to us something given to someone, that we would be called children of God. That's the greatness of it. That's a huge explanation point. That we would be called children of God. And so we ought to, by the power of His Holy Spirit, help us, Lord, to live in the reality of that, that we are children of God. And such we are. It'd be like, <laughs> and such we are. It'd be like, really? We, I, we are? I mean, we are? Really? Yeah, we are. Such we are. That's, that's, what, that's what he's saying there. It's yeah. a Amen. pitch for yourself. <laughs> no humdrum. I got to go to church today. I'm going to church today. The pastor has been calling me. He's been texting me. See if I missed you. It's like, who cares if the pastor misses you, really? I mean, no, it's good. To, we do. We miss each other. But it's like, no, I want to. It's the living God here that we're talking about. Amen. Wild Amen. horses couldn't keep me away. Amen. Okay? Such we are. Such we are. For this reason, it's foreign. Remember I said it's foreign, it's out of this world, it's not of this country. So for this reason, the next part of the verse says, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Well, yeah, it, it, it's foreign to them. It's like, what? Yeah, God, Jesus, follow him? Yeah, really? It's like, makes no sense to me. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. So it says it doesn't know him. The world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. And then he says in verse 2, you could, you could, you could paraphrase verse 2 and put this next in verse 2. That for the Christian, for the child of God, for the true believer, the best is yet to come. That's what verse 2 says. Well, love it. Now we are children of God. Amen. Yeah. And it's not appeared as yet what we will be. Mm. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is. Mm. Praise the Lord. That's Romans 8, 29. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, uh, that's like out of this world. Really? Mm. It's already of what country it doesn't make sense. And now it's like out of outer space. I'm saying extraterrestrial. It's like out of this world. Amen. What is yet to come. There's something great and glorious to look forward to. And the point of what John is saying here in this epistle and in these verses is that it ought to have a profound effect upon the way in which we live today. Okay? A profound effect upon the way in which we live today. This is our destiny. This is our glory, verse 2 says, to be like Jesus. So don't get so upset with yourself. I mean, yes, confess, repent, but don't get so upset with yourself to the point that you give up when every day of your life you're reminded that you need to become more like Jesus. Right. Don't, 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 you know, don't 
but it caused for despair or you give up. That's what these verses are saying here. But it's a cause for hope. Hope in what we are becoming. Mm. Hope in what we will be. Okay? Because when the focus is on ourself, then there's the despair and the despondency and the depression and the dejection and the album is going to give up. But when the thought is on the hope of what we are going to be and what we are becoming, even in the midst of the sin, Take heart. he's working. Right? He, I thought about that when we went to the Grand Canyon on our 25th wedding anniversary. If he hears this big hole in the ground, that's like, and back in my that back in those days when we went, I think I, at the best I had a flip phone. But you try taking a pic, and I had a regular kit. You try taking a picture of it or filming, it's like you can't. It's just so unbelievable, and it's actually so beautiful. And even out of that sin, right, and the flood, and the flood is what put the Grand Canyon there. Out of that sin, this is something beautiful. It's this this thing is beautiful. Like, it's all rock and different colors, but, it, but it's beautiful. And so, what we are going to become and what we are becoming, when it's not yet appeared what we'll be like, is beautiful. And we're becoming more and more like that on a daily basis. Hmm. Oh, it'll be more like Him today. Because we will one day see Him as He is. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Right? That's just, now there's no more sin, there's no more flesh. Just seeing him. And the more we see him now, the more we want him now. And the more we behold him now, we draw near to him and we grow in Christ's likeness. The more we get a glimpse, the more that we see him. Right? That ought to give you great, I know it gives me great joy and great hope. Amen. And that's why verse 3 says, everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has what? The hope. And that's not just I hope I'm a child. That's the hope and the reality and the fact that I'm a child of God. If you're a child of God, you sort of got this like stamped on you. It's like sort of like fixed. It's like fixed on you. Right? Everyone who has this hope on them, that they are a child of God, the hope and the reality that they're a child of God, the hope and the reality that's not yet Thank God it's not what you see, what we see now, it's what we are becoming. And that person who has that hope fixed on them is doing something in the present. And it says there, is purifying himself just as he is pure. It's like he's purifying, he or she's purifying himself just as he is pure. It's like in one sense we're pure, but we're being, you know, we're not completely pure, and we're being purified himself just as he is pure. So when this hope is fixed on a person, it does produce a growing desire to become more like Christ. Um, that's the positive side of it. The, the negative side of it is that to claim to be a child of God, not be purifying oneself, and not be turning from sin when confronted with sin, is to be self-deceived and to be a liar, which the passage talks about in a couple of minutes here. Uh, a liar of all liars. The father of lies. Satan. Verse 4 says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So John defies sin as lawlessness. Sin is a rejection of God's standards to follow one's desires. And so we see there the, the seriousness of sin. I remember listening to a sermon once, and um, <coughs> the illustration was somebody in the congregation was saying, Pastor, you talk about sin just so much, you know, and, and it's like, you talk about sin, and, you know, we're believers in Christ, and, and the preacher was saying, well, sin in the life of a believer is more serious, and serious, if you will, than sin in the life of the unbeliever, okay? And we have an advocate, we're going to see that here in a minute, we have one that we run to in our fight against sin, okay? We don't give up, we don't despair, we confess, we repent, and we keep moving on, and we have that hope fixed on us. Galatians 5, I'm just going to read that a little bit here, 19 through 21, about sin and the seriousness of sin. Galatians 5. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, and this is like, 
person that's practicing these in an habitual way is in great danger. Now the deeds of the flesh, like without any remorse, without any sorrow, without any conviction of sin. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you that just as I forewarn you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's the habitual practice that in, in what First John uh, chapter 3 is talking about. So because God is great, let's appreciate the greatness of God's love for his children. Right? Because God is great. Let's appreciate the greatness of God's love for his children. Then going into uh, verse 5, the next one is we see uh, the greatness of God's I was going to say provision. So I think, what's the word I want to use here? And I'll tell you how, I, well, propitiation is actually what verse 5 says, even though, it does, even though it doesn't use that word. And I was going to use, to use the word provision. Let's appreciate the greatness of God's provision for us in dying on the cross for our sins and saving us and forgiving us. And then I was walking around the church, youth, and I went, and I was doing like a quick... I was doing it for exercise purposes, cardiovascular, I was doing a walk, and it was cold outside, so suddenly do it inside, and I'm praying, I got my prayer thing on my phone, and I'm praying, and I'm praying over the classes, and I'm praying. I went into the youth room, and I saw right on the top of the board, the word, what's the word right on top of the board in your youth room from Ephesians that you're studying? It's the word that's right on the top. Propitiation. Propitiation. Wow. I go, I gotta use that word, propitiation. What's that word mean? Anybody want to tell me that's been... What's that word propitiation mean? Propitiation is like atonement, but it goes further. Yes. It is God transferring the the unblooded life of the sacrifice uh, of the sacrifice to the unclean sinner. Then that's almost word for word. I had to write it down <laughs> off the board, but he's got it memorized pretty much. The act of appeasing God's wrath, transferring the righteousness of the unblemished sacrifice, the unblemished life of the sacrifice, the unblemished life of Christ onto the person transferring that. Propitiation. Good word. Simple way of saying it would be removal of God's <laughs> wrath, but it's the same, it's the same principle. So we're going to see this here. We see the greatness of his love is really tied to the greatness of his propitiation, of his sacrifice, of his atonement, like Hunter said. And verse 5 says, you know. There's that word appeared. It's like three times or more in, this, in these ten verses. Appeared is made visible, made manifest. You know that he appeared. I like this verse because it really gives the full measure of the atonement. He appeared in order to take away sins. That's that wrath removal. Take away. That's that word propitiation. To take away sins and in him... There is no sin, that verse says, right? So you see that, beloved, that the practice of sin in the life of the believer, practice, ongoing, habitual. This is the person that's like, I know, this is like the person who says I'm a believer and there's no biblical evidence. They're actually living in sin. I, I, I remember saying that to somebody. I'm going, I think you may be believing in vain. And they go, well, we know we're living in sin. I'm going, well, that's the very definition of not being a believer in Christ, living in sin, habitually pra practicing sin. And they're like, no, I say, I'm, I'm saved, and, you know, the whole, the whole unbiblical understanding of salvation, which he says here, he came out to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So the practice of sin in the life of a true believer, the practicing of it, or the practice of sin is incomprehensible. So the one that's been born of God, as it says down here later in the passage. Not that we can't sin, we know that we can sin, and we know that we do sin. And that's why right before I even get there, I'll give, give, give it to us now so that we don't go off the tracks here. 1 John 2.1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you 
so that you may not sin. Okay. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Oh, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for all the whole world. So, my little children, in fact, back up the train, 1 John 1, 9, he's writing to believers, he says, my little children here, and in verse 9 of chapter 1, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So, there it is again, the advocate that we go to. Uh, and that, my little children, I'm writing these things so that you will not sin. But if you do, you have an advocate that you run to. So don't misunderstand me and YouTubers and, and Facebook Live. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that a per God's word does not say Christians are perfect and Christians cannot sin. It says Christians cannot practice sin habitually without the con without the the, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and when confronted specifically by God's Word with something that is sinful that I am doing or a person is doing, it'll be, what should I do? And the answer is, confess and repent. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to strengthen you. Ask the Lord to deliver you. We all deal with sin as believers in Christ. But we have a propitiation, we have a wrath, we, will, we'll, we have one who gives us his righteousness, he came to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. That is why, again, to say that a person is a believer in Christ and is living in sin, it's impossible, because in Christ, in him, they're saying they're in him, in him it says there is no sin. A recognition of it, a confession of it, a hatred of it, a, a what must I do? To be saved, or what must I do in light of this sin? Confess from him. And it, could, it's, it's, it could be gossip, it could be anger, it could be, it could be lying, it, it could be all the different types of sins that we can fall into and believers do fall into it. Right? But we have an advocate, and we have the blood of Jesus which continually cleanses us from our sin. Hallelujah. We don't just take it lightly and say, well, I'll just keep on sinning so that God's grace may abound. That's Romans 6. We don't do that's the other perversion, the other extreme. We don't do that. Verse 6 says, No one abides in him sins, no one, no one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The person who's abiding in Christ is not able to sin habitually without the conviction of it. And the desire to turn from it. Okay? It just, it just doesn't work that way. Practice implies continuous action. Yes, a believer, it stumbles into sin. But at the same time, the true believer is no longer under the grip of sin as their life is being controlled more and more by Christ. And actually, I, I love where it says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins in, in him. I like to a lot of times sign letters, and sometimes I'll put in Christ. Paul spoke of that. Paul said that a lot in his epistles. In him or in Christ. And that in him makes me or makes us make, makes me think of that abiding in him. It says here, no one who abides in him sins, and habitually, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. So instead of abiding in sin, where are we supposed to abide? Well, in Christ. That's what, that's what John said in John chapter 15. Uh, verses well, 1 through 11, and I'm just going to read 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So, as a believer in Christ, your struggle with sin. And my struggle of sin has a very direct correlation and relationship to the degree of our abiding in Him. Okay? And sometimes it's just like, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Just hanging on. Lord, just, just help me. Help me. I need you now. Help me. As the Bible says, the spirit is willing, right? The flesh is weak, right? 
Um, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. John says the one who goes on sinning cannot know Christ. Go on sinning. Just go on sinning. Cannot know Christ. Verse 7 says how they are deceived. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Deceived, led away, led astray. The devil is the one out to deceive. The devil is the one out to deceive God's children. John chapter 8, verse 44. says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And then back in 1 John, verse 8 and 9, the one who practices sin is of the devil, and the devil has sinned from the beginning. I love, I love the verse 8b here. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So there is the propitiation again. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Verse 8b says the Son of God came, appeared, there's that word appeared again, made himself manifest for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So we see the great purpose for which Jesus appeared, to destroy the works of the devil. This gets back to what we heard last week about this, about I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Amen. Propitiation. Amen. The practice of sin is evidence and confirmation that one is not born of God. That's what verse 9 says. No one who is born of God practices sin or lives in sin. Living in it. <coughs> Staying in it. The right response to that, the right response to the gospel. If the person that I said that to, or the person that I said that to about how they were living, the response of the one who was saved, they're being saved, would be, I confess that, I repent from that, I turn from that, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. In fact, when it says, because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin, because he is born of God, cannot, it means not able to, not able to live in it. Okay, I keep saying that. We got that, right? We know that, right? Okay. Live in it. So have you been born of God? The phrase born of God points to this divine action. And John rounds off this section by contrasting children of God and children of the devil. By this, the children of God and the children of devil, in verse 10, are obvious. It's like obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness has not had the wrath of God removed from them. And i got to look back at my definition again that Hunter gave us. Has not had the wrath of God removed from them. The act of appeasing God's wrath and transferring the righteousness or unblemished life of the sacrifice. Anyone who does not practice righteousness hasn't had that happen to them. It says they're not of God. Oh, and by the way, church, you're the one who does not love his brother. A whole other sermon there. Mm -hmm. Wow, you see that? Try that one out. Try that one out for size. I just don't like them. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, we just rub me the wrong way. I love them, but I, I just don't like them. I don't have anything to do with them. And the truth be known, when I see them, I show them my disdain and hatred, my real hatred in my heart for them, even though I'm supposed to love them, right? But that's, that's another thought, but the only one who doesn't love is brother, because children of God have experienced this love from God that's just extraordinary and foreign to us. So the person that we're struggling with, yeah, maybe we don't like them, and maybe they rub us the wrong way, but they rub us the wrong way because the problem is with me mm. and not with them, and I need to get myself right confess and repent and forgive and love in spite of that feeling. So John ends here with you, you're, you're either a child of God or a child of the devil, so which do you belong to? A 
Okay, I'll start thinking about applying here. We'll start with, have you received the right? We're talking about being a child of God. I think most of the people here would say they've received the right to become a child of God, that they're saved. Maybe somebody watching this isn't in that category yet. Maybe we call them not yet believers. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, <coughs> even to those who believe in his name. So the person that is saved, the person who is born again, has received We all know that as believers in Christ. They've received Christ. They've received the gift of salvation. Um, and that's how they become a child of God. So not through our religion, not through birth, not through baptism, not through, but through receiving him. In fact, verse 13 says, after it says that who believe in his name, verse 13 says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, born of God, born from above. John 3, 3, you must be born again in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. In 1 John, he mentioned being born of God several times. Next one, let's never forget, this is encouraging here, let's never forget the hope that we have fixed on us. Okay? This is where we get, this is where the, this is where we get into the rubber meets the road, we get down into the trenches and we fight sin. Right? You've got Ephesians chapter 6 with the armor. We fight sin. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's one of the ways that, that's one of the evidences that a person is a child of God. They're fighting sin in their life. And we don't always um, have the victory over it all the time, but we're growing in holiness and we're moving from Romans 7, 24 through 25, doing the very thing I hate, I just can't help it, to Romans chapter 8 and the whole life in the spirit. I love the verse in Romans, I think it's 8, 15, and I pray this. Lord, please, help me. Especially when Cheryl goes to work. <laughs> home alone with the children. Lord, help your spirit to bear witness with my spirit today that I belong to you. Help your spirit bear witness with my spirit and how I live and move and have my being that I belong to you. Help me, Lord. I need your help like that, Lord. And then when I blow it, I, I confess and I repent. That's what we do. Because we got this hope fixed on us. Right? Fixed on him. Fixed on us. Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 14. Or, yeah, Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. You can put this verse 13 right alongside this verse, this verse here. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, puts it this way. Pursue sanctification with all men. Pursue, sorry. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification out which no one will see the Lord. It's the same thing as what John is saying here. The Lord practicing sin individually will not see the Lord. Okay? One who's being sanctified and being changed and, and fighting and, and with, dealing with sin. They're being cleansed. They're being purified. So let's not forget the hope that we have fixed on us in our fight against sin. Okay, let's just go back to this one really quick. We asked the question, have you received the right to become a child of God? For the not saved person, the unsaved person, the not yet believer, maybe somebody watching it on YouTube or Facebook, go to the next one. Has the Lamb of God taken away your sin? I went to church my whole life and heard that phrase. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, happy are those who are called to a suffer, is how it was said. And didn't understand really what that meant, didn't really know what that meant. Um, so the question here for the not yet believer is, has the Lamb of God taken away your sin? 
Has the wrath of God been removed from you? Has the death sentence that... Wow, what a contrast. The believer in Christ has a hope fixed on their head. And the unbeliever has the wrath, the wrath of God fixed on their head. And when they recognize and understand they're under the wrath of God, and they hear that Jesus came to save them, that Jesus came to remove that wrath, and they recognize their sin, because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When they do that, they're like, what must I do to be saved? And they run to the cross, and they run to Jesus in repentance and faith to be saved. Maybe somebody who's hearing this, that will happen to them. They could text in, right? Or whatever they do, they could respond to the message they wanted to. Uh -huh. Do you have that on there? I think we do. This is the case. Okay, that's fine. Disabled comments are fine too for, for other reasons. Yeah. But certainly, if someone wanted to know more and they're watching this, they could. They could contact us. They could contact us. So they could come here and visit if they're around here. That's true. So, has the Lamb, has the Lamb of God taken away your sin? The next day, he saw Jesus. And Jesus is always coming to the person. When the gospel is being spoken of like it is right now, is Jesus is coming to a person, coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who what? Takes away, there it is again, takes away the sin of the world, the world there in the sense of all people, it's only means by which they can be saved, all people who will turn to him and repent of for faith to be saved. Not that all people will be saved or are saved. But that he's the only way in this world <laughs> at which a person may be saved. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I think the last one here is just this last encouragement for application is, and I've kind of said it a couple, uh, a couple times, don't give up when you fail in your fight against sin. Don't give up. Amen. Confess, repent, go to a brother or a sister in Christ, Hey, help me over here. Pray for me. I'm struggling. And, and, and there's just different ways of being helped as children of God, especially newer believers, but even older believers as well. But newer believers, it's so essential uh, for them because it's like sometimes when someone's just saved and they just become born again and there's a great, great honeymoon period going on and they're like on fire there for a period of time and then all of a sudden life comes and difficulties come where they see their sin and like what happened to me is I'm not am I saved and so yes a person is genuinely saved they're saved and they're fighting against sin so don't give up when you fail that's why I already read that verse in 1 John 2 1 where it says my little children are like beloved or children of God it's like a really tender note of affection I'm writing these things to you I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Again, we don't, we, we don't have to. We sin because we want to and because of our flesh life. But sin is not supposed to have mastery and control over all of us. So there is a way out. There is a way of escape from it. You know that verse that says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'm paraphrased, no temptation has saved you. Uh, no temptation has affected you except which is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tested or tempted beyond what you can bear. And sometimes we take that verse, and this is a good way to apply it. God, I'm going through a difficulty. Don't get, I, God's going to give me more than I can bear. I gotta, you promised that. That's one application. But another application that says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. No trial. The other way of applying that is like, there's not a, a, a temptation or a trial or a, or a, or a, or a desire to... There's, there's a capacity to have a way of escape from the sin. The screaming, the, the, I mean, just whatever the sin is, the anger, the, the lying, the hostility, the, whatever the sin is, there's, there's a way of escape for the person. They don't have to do it. They do it just because it feels good. And I don't want to do it. And that's it. And if anyone sins, thank God. We have an advocate, the Father. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, how many times have we heard that word righteous or righteousness in these three verses? Um, so he came not only, Jesus came so that we would not go on sinning, he came to destroy the works of the devil. So, God is great. Amen. Okay. And you can go, you, thank you, you can go to the foundational question, but because God is great, let's appreciate 
the greatness of his love for his children, the greatness of his propitiation for his children. His propitiation includes, he saved me of my sin, he forgiven me of my sin. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven because he's forgiven me, he's taken the wrath away from me. And propitiation and, 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 the, and the salvation also includes, he's delivering me from the power of sin in my life. Now that I don't have to practice it. In fact, I can't just practice it. And he's delivering me from that power over me. And I have this hope fixed on me, being purified and cleansed and being made more like Jesus. So I just keep fighting my, against sin. And it's not like, it's not like, it's just, it's, it's that abiding in him and it's that relationship with him and it's through the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, all right. How does seeing the glory of the greatness of God affect the way I live today? How does seeing the glory and the greatness of God and my fight against sin and the victory over sin, how does it affect the way I live today? Um, 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, or see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And such we are. So, let's praise Him. Let's think about the greatness of God in saving us. Let's think of the greatness of God's love for us. Okay, yeah, give me the quote for the week by Andrew Murray, please. Andrew Murray wrote, Read all that God's Word says about the love of Christ. Meditate on the words. Let them sink into your heart. Sooner or later, they'll begin to realize the greatest happiness of my life is that I'm loved by the Lord Jesus and I may live in fellowship with Him all day long. Let your heart continually say, His love for me is unspeakable. He will keep me abiding in His love. How great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God and such we are. Let that sink deep down into your soul. That ought to kindle within us a desire for Christ-likeness, for holiness. It ought to give us the hope of being cleansed and purified by sin by the Lord. Let's seek to live stronger in obedience to the Lord. In our fight against sin, let's remember that we have an advocate. And just let me read one more scripture and then two more scriptures. This is what Paul did. Like, this is like the how-to. Here. It's Philippians chapter 3. Uh, I gotta just do verses 12 through 14. Not that I've already obtained it. What? Christ likeness, purity, holiness, fullness of that. Not that I've already obtained it or already been made become perfect. But what do I do? How do I do it? He says, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. What were we, what did he lay hold of us for? For, for himself, for his Lord, for Christ's likeness. I want to lay hold of that. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. I do sin, and I struggle. But he says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and some of us have to forget a lot of things that lie behind, like the path, but just forget about struggle with the sin that you just had and confess and repent and move on. Forget what's lying behind. Reaching toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we will be called children of God. And such we are. We, we are. Hallelujah, we Lord. We are. Thank you, Lord. For this reason, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Yes. It's not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him yes. because we will see Him mm. just as He is. Right. Everyone who has this hope fixed on them, who's had this wrath removed, this propitiation of sin, everyone who has this wrath removed has this hope fixed on Him or her, purifies Himself just as He is pure. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Help us to understand. Help us to understand. Help us to appreciate the greatness of your love. I, I, I'm still, 
just walk around saying how great a love the Father has bestowed upon me. And the focus there, I'm, I'm praying, but I'm preaching. I'm, I'm praying, but I'm preaching. The focus there is not on you. It's on the greatness of His love for you and His Amen. love for me. How great is the love the Father has bestowed upon us. We are His children. Help us, Lord, to live in the reality of the center of that, of the greatness of who you are of your great love for us, the greatness of who you are, what you've done, and help us to remember, Lord, who we are as your children, who we are in the light of your glorious presence, to press on, and to go after, and to confess, and to repent, and to live for you. Oh, Lord, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.